We are back, folks, and we are joined now by Usama Mokdisi, host of the uh, podcast Mokdisi Street, professor of history and chancellor's chair at the University of California, Berkeley, author uh, of books, including his most recent one, Age of Coexistence, the uh, ecumenical frame. Uh, gosh, I don't know if I pronounced ecumenical. that right. Ecumenical frame and the making of the modern Arab world. Um, you know, clearly you're smarter than me. You know how to pronounce big words. Uh, Usama, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Um, so as a professor, obviously a historian who's dedicated, you know, your career to, to studying the Arab world, this region, um, we, we opened the show talking about the ICJ uh, South Africa genocide case, but I'm hoping we can give people even more historical context on how we got to this moment. And you wrote an excellent piece in Jacobin as well about how the Western relationship with Zionism is rooted in this deep racism towards the Middle East and towards Arab people in general. Um, you know, why do you think that's so important for people to understand as we're in this, you know, horrific historical moment for the Palestinian people. Well, I mean, the, the most obvious point, of course, to point is, is that Zionism emerged in Europe in the 19th century, and it's what most people, what's most obvious to historians of the Middle East, to Palestinians, to Arabs, to anyone who knows the history of this region, is that Zionism emerged in Europe in response to European anti-Semitism, in response to European racism and nationalism. And it adopted a European solution, which is colonialism in Palestine to create a Jewish state in a multi-religious land. And in despite a multi-religious, the wishes of a multi-religious people, the Palestinians. And so that this whole idea of Zionism emerging in the 19th century Europe, led by European Zionists, um, European Jewish Zionists, imposed on the Palestinians with the support of the liberal West, as well as of the Christian Zionist West, um, has has done enormous damage, and it was uh, the thing. The, the most obvious thing is that it's a European problem, a European um, movement that seeks a solution at the expense of non-Europeans. I mean, it's as, it's as blatant and as clear as that for anyone who studies the historical record. And of course, it was at the expense also of Arab and Eastern Jews as well, because of course they were not Zionists initially. Because again, Zionism comes from Europe. So I think that's that's the quick answer. We've we've highlighted Avi Schleim's work uh, here on this program uh, mm -hmm. and his perspective as an Arab Jewish person and what that shift was like in kind mm -hmm. of experiencing the nationalism coming from Zionism um, once he uh, moved to Israel. And um, I guess I think you know it's not a radical idea that groups that have experienced deep trauma and marginalization, um, and, and, and in the case of, of Jews in, in Europe, <laughs> the Holocaust, one of the worst crimes in human history, um, it's not a radical idea that, the, that, that certain groups that are marginalized can also hold racist notions of other groups. And... Um, and yet I think, you know, the Western construction of Israel in the way it's discussed is that, that it's reparations for the Holocaust, um, but it, it's at the expense of another marginalized group. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and that was obvious at the time. And that was pointed out, of course, by Palestinians and by Arabs and by, uh, in, in fact, by, by many people around the world who understood perfectly well even before the Holocaust. It's important to point out that Zionism emerged long before the Holocaust in the 19th century. And Zionist leaders, whether it's Weizmann or later on Ben-Gurion or, or any of the Israeli leaders, most of whom were born, of course, in Europe and who ended up in Palestine, um, had, of course, extraordinarily racist and demeaning views of the Arabs, of Muslims, of Eastern Jews as well. It's important to point that out. And the, the whole argument of atoning for Western anti-Semitism, and then of course the, the horrors of the Holocaust at the expense of the Palestinians was pointed out by Palestinians as profoundly unjust. If Europeans and Germans in particular want to atone for the Holocaust, well then atone for the Holocaust at the expense of Germany, not at the expense of Palestinians. Right. And this was pointed out in 1938, in fact, I mean, even before the Holocaust, uh, after 
uh, you know, when, when it was clear that there was German Nazi anti-Semitism, when it was clear there was anti-Jewish uh, um, racism and anti-Semitism in Europe, and uh, an Arab historian by the name of George Antonius, whom I talk about in the book, Age of Coexistence, points this out, and he said it's completely outrageous. What's happening to Jews in Europe is outrageous, but it's absolutely outrageous to, to amend for their persecution at the expense of another people. That is the ultimate form of hypocrisy, I'm paraphrasing. But uh, that's been the Western sort of position all the way until today. I mean, the scandal of Western liberal atonement for the Holocaust is that it's always done at the expense of the Palestinians. And that really is the great scandal. It, it is, certainly. And it, it's in quite in keeping with other kind of um, surface level attempts at reparations for the crimes of Western powers, whether it be colonialism um, and whether it be chattel slavery. Uh, we, we've documented on this program how you know, Haiti was forced to pay reparations, no. not to the enslaved black people, but to the slave owners for their loss of, uh, uh, of capital, essentially. And, you know, the, 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 the problem with Western powers dictating the terms of reparations when they are the perpetrators and perpetrators of uh, of the violence themselves is that they create systems that um, never really hold themselves to account. And we're seeing kind of like that clear um, th that's so clearly right now in in yeah the 75 years of, of displacement of Palestinians. And now, of course, the. Uh, the, the crimes of genocide that Israel is committing. Yeah, and also just the refusal to acknowledge and the refusal, the, the, the culture of denialism around what happened in 1948 to the Palestinians, the, the whole denialism around the question of, well, Palestine was a multi-religious place where Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived together for centuries and centuries, and then it was a European idea to create an ethno-religious nationalist state, a Jewish state in Palestine, directly at the expense and in flagrant sort of violation of the wishes of the native population, all this history is sort of very obvious. There's, the, the history is overwhelming. And what's amazing uh, as a scholar, as a historian, and, and even as a layperson, the evidence is overwhelming. The archives are fairly accessible. And, and it's amazing how, how little attention there is to this sort of blatant imposition of an ethno-religious nationalist state in a multi-religious area and the damage that's been done ever since. And we still we see it all the way till today, of course, what's going on in Gaza. And the horrors in Gaza um, are extraordinary. And the Western, I mean, honestly, Emma, the Western sort of state's reaction to the last three months of genocidal violence against Palestinians, irrespective of where one stands on this conflict, the idea of over 10,000 Palestinian children killed before our eyes live streamed on social media, it's shocking. Honestly, it's shocking. It's, it's, so, it's so unconscionable. And yet you have Western states, Western liberal institutions, universities, and so on that have taken no position on this or have taken a hostile position towards Palestinians. It's really quite shocking. I, I mean, for me, and we've, uh, we're re I'm restating a lot of what I've said before here on the show, but it is this redefinition of anti-Semitism in the West as not of one that is of hatred of Jews or um, holding racist attitudes and, and bigoted attitudes towards Jewish people, but one of that is in opposition to Western power um, and the... Or to the state of Israel. Or, or to, right, exactly. Or to the state yeah. of Israel. But it, by extension, right, like kind of... I, I, last night in the debate, Nikki Haley described Israel as a bright spot in the region. And I feel like she could amend it and say it's a bit of a white spot um, because, you know, the there. I, I think maybe some people have a difficult time really conceiving of Israel as an extension of Western white supremacy in that way because of uh you know the the victimization of Jewish people by a you know fascist white supremacist Nazi government in and of itself. Um, you know it, it's a delicate topic, but I'm wondering if you could expand on that idea. On the idea of being the victims of the victims, you mean, or which well, one? Well, the idea of it being kind of um, a state, an extension of of whiteness to a degree, and white uh, and and Western whiteness, even. Um, 
and how that notion does ch uh, is ever changing, I guess, and, and it's fluid, but that in practice, at least for me, um, and you can assess my opinion on this uh, and, and give your thoughts, but that feels to me like, um, you know, a part of the conversation that is difficult to have. Well, I think I think what it is, of course, is it's in a continuation of Western settler colonialism is really what it is and racial theories. I mean, there is a lot of complication, obviously, because as you said, we're talking about about sort of there is a history of anti-Semitism and there is a reality of anti-Semitism um, in the West in particular. And what's shocking, of course, in the redefinition of anti-Semitism that you're alluding to. I mean, there's an organized campaign led, you know, by, by various bodies and organizations to basically insist that anti-Semitism is not what we understand, what everyone understands anti-Semitism to have been. In other words, hatred and prejudice against Jews, but an opposition to the state of Israel's policies. It's apartheid, it's, it's ideology of colonial Zionism. And so what, what's happened in effect is that you can be, the amazing thing is that you have right-wing people who are vehemently anti-Jewish and of course anti-Muslim and anti-Arab and anti-Black and anti-everything and yet they're okay, they're given a pass because they're pro-Israel. So the, the, where you stand on Israel's apartheid has become sort of the definition of where one, whether one is or isn't an anti-Semite. And that is absurd because, you know, you cannot be a truly, you can't truly be against anti-Jewish, you can't be against anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Semitism, uh, and not also be against anti-Palestinian hatred and anti-Arab and, and, and anti hatred and anti-Muslim hatred and anti-Black hatred which is precisely why we see across college campuses in this country, and in fact around the world, you see a coalition of people, especially younger people, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, progressive Jewish, uh, black, white, across the board, you have this extraordinary coalition of people who are mobilizing for justice. And that really is the most heartening thing. In terms of the question of supremacy, yes, there's a lot of parallels with white supremacy. I mean, apartheid is the most obvious thing. Every human rights organization has said that what Israel is doing in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, in Gaza, inside Israel, is apartheid. And that's exactly tied to this history of white supremacy. And, and, but the difference, I think, Emma, the difficulty is that unlike apartheid, and I've had this discussion with my brothers on the Maktisi Street podcast, but the, the difficulty is that unlike apartheid South Africa, you have many people, including colleagues of mine, who are incredibly smart, sensitive people who still support the state of Israel. They, they, they refuse to understand what Israel does to the Palestinians. And, and so you have that, that's a, it's a complicated thing in that sense. But I keep pointing out to them that when Palestinians and allies, including progressive Jewish anti-Zionists, as well as people of faith and good conscience around the world, organize against Zionism, they are in effect, they are in effect doing exactly what people did in fighting against apartheid South Africa, against the Jim Crow South in this country. In other words, you're fighting against a system of apartheid, you're not fighting against people. And ultimately, right. The, the, right, the argument is that we want to have a, a, a liberated Palestine, Israel, whatever you want to call it, where everyone is equal. But you can't have equality and have an ethno-religious nationalist state. It just simply does not work. I, it's incompatible. And I, I think, you know, it's often, I've had very similar conversations, obviously, with people who are liberal uh, on everything except except Palestinian rights. And um, it's often phrased as, well, you know, you have to see my side. You know, there's the, there's two yeah. sides to this. There's one side and there's another side. And it's, it's framed as a religious conflict. Um, yeah. And that is fundamentally wrong based on everything we've talked about it's it's about colonialism it's about imperialism but i think there's also a a, a, a um you know a bigotry that that underlines that as well which is this notion and, and you'll hear it a lot like israel represents the cosmopolitan west um it represents the uh ideals of liberalism of gay rights you'll hear even though i don't that gay marriage I don't think is legal in Israel. Um, it, it represents fem women's rights. And, and it's um, and, and on the other side, there's the barbarism of the Palestinians. Um, and, you know, that that is, I feel that bigotry that does underlie that Zion, uh, uh, that Zionism, right? Um, racist tropes about uh, Arab people that are is inherent to that ideology. Yeah, I mean, there's an erasure of Palestinian history and humanity. And of course, there's an erasure of the fact that Palestine was and remains a multicultural, multi-religious place. 
And the reality is that, of course, Zionism emerged in Europe. I mean, I can't stress this point enough because it did not emerge among Jewish communities, ancient indigenous Jewish communities in the Middle East. And this is a point that every Zionist sort of apologist has to sort of avoid because it's so obvious in terms of it's not about being Jewish. It's about being Zionist and, and about imposing the Zionist project on people in the Middle East with, all, as you said, all these tropes, these tropes of, uh, you know, if you read Weizmann, if you go back and you read, and again, these are all available. You read Weizmann's letters, and he's one of the leaders of the Zionist movement in the early 20th century. Read his letters to Balfour. They're kind of shocking what he says about Arabs. Um, and what he says about sort of Eastern Jews, they're shockingly racist. In fact, you would say they're anti-Semitic. If you just switch the word Arab and Jew, it's, it's truly shocking. And read what, read what uh, Israeli historians like Benny Morris, what they say in interviews in 2004. Again, shocking racism. See what the Israelis today are saying. It's absolutely unconscionable what so many Israelis, I mean, when I say most Israelis, there are, of course, exceptions. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the history we're dealing with right now. We're dealing with this legacy of denial um, and, and this the, all these tropes that get used, they're all, like, in other words, uh, pinkwashing and so on and so forth. These are all there to cover up a basic reality that the vast majority of the world today sees. And the South African case at the ICJ, I think, lays out in crystal clear language that this is an unconscionable state of affairs no people should be subjected to what the Palestinians are being subjected to. And honestly, the history of the Middle East is crystal clear. There is a profound history of religious uh, coexistence and of secular coexistence as well, with all the ups and downs, all the variations that, that any good historian would tell you are you know, part of that history. Um, on the other hand, what you have today is an ethno-religious nationalist state that's insisting on its right to sort of carry out uh, genocide uh, they don't call it a genocide, but of course that is exactly what's happening in the name of sustaining this kind of um, state project. Yeah, if you could just uh, go even further in addressing how um, defenders often of Israel will say that there has been religious turmoil in the region for thousands and thousands of years. This I mean, is that's some absurd. Way a yeah. continuation of it. Yeah, if you could just, just ex expand on that. It, it's absurd. I mean, the historical record is there. I mean, historians, yeah. you know, there, there's no such thing as a perfect history. And, and every history of coexistence is also a history of, of sectarianism. And every history of sectarianism is also a history of coexistence. In other words, wherever you have pluralism, you're going to have uh, inevitably tensions. That's the same in America. It's the same in Europe. It's the same in, in India. It's the same in any society where there is pluralism. And so too in the Ottoman Empire, and so too in the Islamic world, and so too in the Arab world. No surprise there. The, the, the point, of course, is that why is it that in Europe, despite the history of fanatical religious violence between Protestants and Catholics, the, mm. the, the horrific sort of history of, of anti-Jewish, anti-Semitism in Europe, in America, the history of racism that goes on, as you know, and as you guys have talked about on your show many times, the history of racism that, that's with us until now, the history of the obliteration of indigenous populations. All these things that take place in the West, somehow we say, okay, these are terrible things that have happened, yet we can still be multicultural, we can still believe in equality, we can believe in secular citizenship, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the Middle East, where there's a history, a much more profound history of religious coexistence between Muslims, Christians, and Jews, somehow we're told, oh, no, 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 in the Middle East, despite this history, no, these people are barbarians, they're sectarian, they're always fighting, it's absurd. It's completely untrue. And, you know, I challenge anyone to go back and look at the history. And, and, and that's why I wrote this book, Age of Coexistence, precisely to, to point out that the history, in fact, is, is infinitely more positive. With all, again, without whitewashing the history, infinitely more positive. And, and the, the real issue is that colonial Zionism and European racism in the mandate period in the early 20th century came in and divided up this region, the Middle East, the Arab East, into various bits and pieces to suit European imperial interests and of course to suit the Zionists. And they destroyed Palestine and, and look what's happened to Syria, look what's happened to Lebanon, look what's happened to Iraq. I mean, it, it's a catastrophe, honestly.
Yeah, Professor, I wasn't able to find it, but I, I saw a bit of a pro-Israel propaganda responding to the genocide uh, charge, and it pointed to populations of Jews in Arab countries and how that went down following the uh, uh, foundation of Israel. And, you know, I think as we, you guys sort of mentioned earlier, that's because of the rise of nationalism that that project engendered in the region. And it actually shows that Jews lived in those Arab countries prior to the state, as you say, in an age of coexistence. Yeah, I mean, again, that's, again, one of these Zionist arguments that that's, again, on the face of it absurd, because what happened, of course, to the Arab Jews or Jews who lived in the Arab world, however you want to describe uh, these people, is, of course, terrible. What happened after 1948 in terms of in Iraq and Yemen and other places what was was a horrific thing. But, of course, it doesn't, A, excuse the, the, the Nakba of 1948, and second, as you point out, it's tied to the Nakba. In other words, the only reason these are, these are two sides of the same catastrophe. And so I refuse anyone who says it's either this or that. Both are aspects of the same terrible ethno-religious nationalist project that came in and destroyed the history of coexistence in our part of the world. And that doesn't excuse the people who reacted negatively, but um, that, that, that's what I would say in, in terms of a response to that, that particular piece of propaganda. But again, uh, what, I, what I do point out in the book, um, In Age of Coexistence, is that there were massacres of Christians in the 19th century, in Damascus in particular, in 1860. And there was no Jewish question in the Middle East. I mean, that's important, again, for, for your listeners and, and viewers to know. There was no Jewish question in the Middle East. There was in Europe, of course, because of anti-Semitism. But in the Middle East, the Jews were not the minority that were singled out in the 19th century. There were, the Armenians were eventually, and that's why there's an Armenian genocide that takes place. But there wasn't a Jewish question as such. And, and the interesting thing is that there were massacres of Christians, for example, in Damascus in 1860. But what you find is that Christian Arabs were the ones who, who, who were at the forefront of elaborating an ecumenical, which just means like a, a culture that transcends religious difference into, um, into a unifying uh, political social sort of identity of being Arab in the 19th and early 20th century. All this happened. And, and so when the, when the Nakba occurs in 1948, and there was, for example, a, an attack on Jews in Iraq, even before the Nakba in 1941, in the, in the Farhud of 1941. So there was an attack on Jews in Baghdad, and it was a terrible event. But there's no reason why Iraqi Jews, uh, like Ave Shlaim's family that you mentioned, Emma, there's no reason why Iraqi Jews couldn't have been and, and would have been, in fact, in a, in a different universe, would have been at the forefront of elaborating a new kind of Iraq. But I think Zionism, honestly, Zionism, Zionism's whole premise is that you cannot be an Arab Jew. You simply cannot be. You're either Arab or Jewish. Remember, there was no such thing as an Arab-Jewish conflict before the arrival of Zionism in Palestine in the Arab East. There was no such thing. There's no reason why one could be a Christian Arab a Muslim Arab and not be a Jewish Arab. There's absolutely no reason for that, were it not for Zionism. Right. I mean, you see, uh, uh, there's even denial. I saw from, uh, I think it was like the mayor of Jerusalem, that there even are Christians in Gaza. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, I mean it, that, that, that it's, goes it's so deep. Arab equals Muslim equals yeah, barbarian. Um, last question before we, we let you go, uh, Usama. I just wanted to bring it back to the ICJ, uh, the, 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 the genocide uh, hearings opening today. Um, as a historian, could you talk more about the significance of South Africa leading the charge in this case um, and what your assessment is of this moment in history? Well, I think it's profound. It's incredibly moving. Uh, it, it testifies to the spirit of post-apartheid South Africa. It points to the fact that the vast majority of the world, Emma, the vast majority of the world sides with uh, the, the, the Palestinians and with the South African case. It's, it's evident. And if you follow the, the hearings and you've had a clip of it and, you know, I've, I've been watching this, it's, it's extraordinary, the detail. We've never had a genocide committed in our time, live stream before our eyes, where the victims are also live streaming their own sort of brutalization and victimization by the Israeli state and the Israeli officials have been absolutely explicit in their intentions. So I think that it's, it's profound. And if you look at the, the South Africans who are presenting, notice who they are. They represent the gamut of South Africa, the new South Africa, black and white, together, working together to present a case um, that is, is, is extraordinary. Any person of conscience should be able to say, this is wrong, this is unacceptable. Uh, 
this genocide should stop. And I hope, I don't know what's going to happen, of course, because as you said, it's politics in the end, um, in terms of the amount of pressure the US and Israel, the UK, and other European states are going to put on, on these judges is going to be enormous. But the reality is, and you see it everywhere, there is a generational shift, a paradigm shift taking place everywhere. Young people no longer buy the propaganda that's been that they, that that our generation, my generation in particular, has been subjected to, and my parents' generation were subjected mm -hmm. to. So things are changing, and the only question is, how fast? How fast will things change, and how many more innocent people are going to be slaughtered before the case of South Africa, uh, you know, gets a fair hearing? So I, I hope I hope that 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 uh, the ICJ will rule um, affirmatively just to stop this genocide. But we know that even if they do rule affirmatively, it's not going to stop necessarily because we're talking about geopolitics. Absolutely. At least I'm praying it can be some sort of pressure uh, mechanism. But um, Usama uh, Maktisi, the host of the Maktisi Street podcast, professor of history uh, at University of California, Berkeley, and the book is called Age of Coexistence, Coexistence the Ecumenial Frame and Making of the Modern Arab World. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the description uh, wherever you're listening to this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Usama. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me.